How would you like to eliminate anger and contention from your life? In order to be happy, what we all need more than anything else is to feel loved. Real love is the missing piece of the puzzle in life and relationships. It's transformed my life. I now know what joy really is and what I'm looking for. Real love saved my marriage. What we've experienced is we are learning how to love each other. When we understand real love, and especially when we actually find it, everything changes. It's always about real love. opened his mouth and he started the seminar he had my attention. I've wanted to have really healthy, good relationships. And yes, something's always been wrong, something's always been missing. And knowing what to do in those moments when you know it's really going downhill and where everything's falling apart and you're in an argument with somebody you love and, and you know it's bad and you're just kind of like doing what you always do and it's, yep, there we go again, we're going what, and to know what to do to change that. It's transformed my life. I promise you that if you will learn and apply the principles of real love, you will find a level of peace and happiness most people can't imagine. You will also be able to participate in healthy, powerful relationships. We're going to talk today about some principles that have changed the lives, literally, of hundreds of thousands of people across the world. And I have every confidence, in fact, I promise you, that if you listen carefully, it will change the way you see everything. That's a pretty big promise. Before we get to the principles, let me tell you about a man who died, went to heaven, and found himself standing in a long line that was waiting for the uh, interview with St. Peter at the gates. And he waited in line for the longest time, and the line moved slowly forward. But he was beginning to get some confidence because he noticed that most of the people were getting through the gates. He thought, well, maybe this isn't as hard as I thought. He'd been scared about this his whole life long. He got up to the gates finally there, and St. Peter was standing there at, uh, at his desk. And, and St. Peter said, spell love. And the guy thought, well, you're kidding. I've been worried about this all these years, and that's it? It's got to be like a trick question, right? But he couldn't think of a trick answer, so he said, okay. L-O-V-E. St. Peter said, you're in. And he thought, oh, cool, all that worry for nothing. And, and as soon as he was about to go through the gate, this little guy came scurrying up to St. Peter. And St. Peter leaned over and listened to the guy. And then St. Peter said to the man, he said, look, I've got to go run an errand. He said, would you mind taking my place here at the desk? He said, well, sure, I can do that. He said, all you have to do is ask him the question that I asked you. I can do it. So he asked several people in line, you know, spell L-O-E-V-E, and they all got it right, so he let them in the gates. And after about five or six people, his wife stood in front of the desk. And he said, well, what are you doing here? And she said, well, I was on the way home from your funeral, and the car was hit by a bus, and I was killed. And he said, what are the odds? And she said, what are you doing here? And he said, well, you know, St. Peter asked me to substitute for him here for just a couple of minutes. He said, uh, I'm here to administer the test. And she said, wow, what's the test? And he said, oh, it's easy. Spell Czechoslovakia. <laughs> well, the principles that we're going to talk about here today are going to give you enough enlightenment that you're going to be able to tell the difference between love and Czechoslovakia, which is going to turn out is going to be pretty darn important. We're going to, in the next several hours, solve almost all the world's problems. That's quite a claim, isn't it? And I'm not kidding. I've done this presentation now hundreds of times all over the world, and I have seen that claim fulfilled over and over again. We really are going to solve the world's problems. Before we get to solving them, Let's name just a few of them. For example, what percent of marriages end up in divorce? Do you know that we're up to 60%? 60%. Now keep in mind, these are the very best of relationships. Do you get that? 
It's not like when people get married, you know, it's not, you don't run up, walk up to somebody and say, wow, I really hate your guts. Would you like to marry me? Right? <laughs> By the time two people get married, they've gone through how many dates, do you think? 20, 30, 50? How many relationships? We've sifted through dozens of relationships before we finally settle on somebody to marry. And by the time we marry them, they're the one, aren't they? Right? So these are the best relationships in the world. And out of those, 60% end up in the toilet. Isn't that amazing? Now, what about the remaining 40%? Are they all happy? Not even close. In fact, many of the worst marriages on the planet are those that continue, those that stay married. In fact, there was a study done several years ago of several thousand women. And these women, uh, it was discovered that if it weren't for finances and children, 50% of these women would dump their husbands in a heartbeat. Isn't that impressive? So we started off with 100 marriages, and divorce gets rid of 60 of them, so down to 40. 50% would dump their husbands if they could. Now we're down to 20% of marriages that would even stay together if they had a choice. It's kind of discouraging, don't you think? Oh, it gets much worse than that. In my experience, after counseling now with thousands of couples, my personal estimate, and I think it's kind of just kind of generous, is that one to two percent of marriages end up as happy as they had once hoped, which is one definition of success. One to two percent. Does that discourage you or what? Now, does everybody here know what Russian roulette is? Surely you do. Those of you who don't, you take a revolver and this cylinder has six chambers in it and you put just one bullet in one of the six chambers and you snap it shut and you spin it and then you hold it to your head and I guess depending on whether you're in a good mood or a bad mood you pull the trigger and either hope or don't hope it's gonna blow your brains out is there anybody here who'd be willing to play Russian roulette with me no gutless <laughs> I mean your chances of surviving this are five and six and yet you wouldn't play right yet and yet look at the relationship revolver. Here we have a gun that has a cylinder with 100 chambers in it. You get this picture? With 98 bullets in it. And yet we willingly go out there and spin it and hold it to our heads. <laughs> you see two people out on a junior prom date, you know, and, and don't they just look gorgeous? And people say, oh, it's so cute. <laughs> I think it would be much kinder if we just shot him in the head. <laughs> It'd be faster. The chances of people having successful relationships are dismal. And until we do something dramatically different from what we're doing now, we will only succeed in repeating those statistics and that misery. Do you see that? We always think we'll be different, don't we? If you go to Las Vegas and you gamble long enough at the slot machines, you will lose. Oh, you might win for a day, you might win occasionally, but overall you will lose. Those are the odds. And those are the odds with relationships. And yet we keep playing. Wouldn't you think that eventually we would learn what's going wrong and do something differently? And yet so far we're not. Now that's just one of the problems. Do you know that 10 to 20 percent of the adults in this country are addicted to alcohol or drugs? Multiply that by 200 million people plus, that's a pretty big number. One out of nine men will spend some time of his life in a prison or a penitentiary or a jail. One out of nine. Pretty dismal. 21% of ninth graders have already had four or more sexual partners. Any of those numbers bother you? Now, you know, as we hear these numbers, you've got to wonder, are they getting worse or are we just reporting them better? Don't you wonder that sometimes? Because every generation says, oh, those kids. Well, there was a study done back in the 1950s, and this result came out just, I think, two or three years ago. Back in the 1950s, they did a standardized psychological profile of several thousand children, and they put the results on a shelf, and they repeated the test in our day. 
and they found that the average American child now experiences more anxiety, which is a great test for unhappiness, right? You can't be anxious and happy. The average American child now experiences more anxiety than the average child psychiatric patient did in the 50s. That bother you? Mm -hmm. One way of interpreting that study would be to say that the average American child now would qualify as insane in the 1950s. So all of these statistics are utterly depressing and they're getting worse. Despite the fact that we are pouring countless billions of dollars into these problems, aren't we? And who knows how many hours of crying and worry and therapy and government programs and all that stuff and none of it's improving. And the reason that it's not improving is because we haven't identified the fact that all of these apparently different problems are united by one cause. It's really all one problem. And until we address it, the other problems will keep recurring. What's the problem? You know, there were two climbers climbing a hill. And they got about halfway up the mountain. They came over a rise, and out in the middle of nowhere, there was this beautiful meadow. And there was a village there, and people were laughing and playing and singing and having a great time. And while they were watching this idyllic scene, a boulder rolled down the mountain and flattened one of the huts and knocked people right and left. Broken bones and bleeding people all over the place. They jumped up from what they were doing and administered what first aid they could. And while they were doing that, another boulder rolled down. And again, knocking people right and left and injuring them. And another boulder. And after that, it happened several times. One of the climbers turned and started running up the mountain away from the village. And the other climber said, well, where are you going? There are all these people that we've got to take care of. You've got to stay and help me. And the climber who was running up the mountain said, you stay and you do what you can do but I'm going to go and figure out who's pushing the boulders down the mountain. You'd think after something happened over and over enough times, we'd figure out why it was happening instead of just binding up the wounds and splinting the broken bones, wouldn't you? We get trapped in the cycle of repairing things instead of identifying what the real problem is. And that's what we've got to get to. So what is the problem? We can't talk about solving human problems until we identify what the greatest human need is. And the greatest human need that we have is to be happy, isn't it? Anybody disagree? Isn't that what we want most? If you can think of something cooler, email me. That's what we want most. But do you know that on the whole, we don't know what happiness is. We don't even talk much about it. Instead, we talk about problems. You know, the National Institutes of Health several years ago published an article describing how many articles had been written in the previous three years about mental illness. 15,000 articles had been written on the subject of mental illness. You know how many had been written on the subject of happiness? Less than 10. One of the reasons that we don't talk much about happiness is that we think already that we know what it is, don't we? You ask people, what's happiness? Well, pff, I know that. When I was a little kid, I was told that if I studied hard and got good grades and did all the right things, made everybody happy and didn't screw up too much, then and got, had a good career and made lots of money, then I would be successful and happy. Any of the rest of you told that? Well, I was especially stupid. I believed them. And so I worked very hard to be successful and to do what it took to achieve the happiness that was described to me. And I was very good at it. I was valedictorian in my high school. I was the best in my college class. I was the top of my medical school class. I established a huge surgical practice, traveled all around the country lecturing other physicians, uh, teaching at medical schools. By age 35, I had accomplished every goal I'd ever set. Can you imagine that? You know how people sit around and they say, if only I had more blank, I'd be happy? I had all the blanks. All of them. And I was still miserable. Well, that's pretty discouraging. When you've done everything that everybody tells you will make you happy and you're still not happy, that's a bit of a drag, don't you think? I couldn't sleep at night. I started taking sleeping pills, then sedatives, then narcotics. And before long, I was injecting narcotics every single day. I was a narcotics addict for years 
while I was a surgeon. That's not a good thing. In fact, 25% of your surgeons are presently addicted to narcotics. Bet you didn't know that. A little scary, huh? Next time your surgeon comes to you and says, will you sign this permit, for, permit consent form, you say, sure, after you pee in this cup. <laughs> it's that common. In fact, I got to the place where I was sitting in the woods behind my house with a loaded Smith & Wesson to my head. That's pretty unhappy. Well, eventually I got into drug treatment, which just got me to the place where I was sober and miserable, and started looking for what really makes people happy. And I'll be darned if I didn't find out what it was. If I didn't find out what that one thing is that we have to have in order to be happy. Do you remember that movie City Slickers? Where Curly said it all boils down to one thing. You know, it really is just one thing. So what is the one thing that we've all got to have? Do you know after World War I, as you might imagine, there were a lot of orphans in Europe, thousands and thousands of them. And the, the, in those days, they kept them in large orphanages. We don't do that much anymore. And in Germany, there was a particularly large orphanage where there was one physician who did a statistical survey of the health of the infants in their care. They found that 75% of their infants age one and under died, 75%. To give you a picture of the huge death rate that that is, you've all heard of anthrax, right? It's one of the weapons of mass destruction. If I were to intentionally infect everybody in the room with anthrax, I couldn't kill three quarters of you. And yet 75% of these kids were dying. They repeated the test on the east coast of the United States and they found some orphanages where 90% of the kids died age one and under. And they couldn't figure out a cause. These kids had the best medical care, the best nutrition, clothing, shelter, everything. Better than the kids on the outside of the orphanages and yet they were dying. Why? Nobody knew. Well, in the succeeding decades, we've changed our approach to orphans, haven't we? When was the last large orphanage you saw? Now we put kids in foster homes, don't we? And when they started putting kids in foster homes, you know what happened? All the kids lived. Isn't that amazing? The difference is this. Even though those kids in the orphanages had all the physical advantages in the world, when they cried, there was nobody there to pick them up and hold them. That's it. These kids got sick, became mentally ill, and died from a lack of being loved. That's all. Wow. Now you'd think we'd have learned something from that, but we haven't learned much. To this day, the one thing that we have to have more than anything else in order to be happy is to feel loved. Now when I say that, don't you kind of intuitively know that? Huh? I mean, the Beatles knew that. All you need is love. <laughs> But see, not just any kind of love will do. How many times has somebody, either with their words or their behavior, indicated to you, oh, I love you. And then five minutes later said, are you the one that did this? <laughs> and then that I love you feeling is gone pretty quickly, isn't it? Oh yeah. oh, yeah. Like gone in a second. And that's because that kind of love counts for nothing. The only kind of love that can make us happy is what I call real love. Real love is where I care about your happiness without wanting anything from you in return. Isn't that a simple definition? You know that I've been on national panels of experts where they've talked about love and at the end of the panel I've had these experts actually say on radio and television, well you know you really can't define love but you know it when you see it. You're kidding. No, we can define it. Real love is me caring about your happiness without wanting anything from you in return. It's not real love when I do what you want and you like me. So what? <laughs> Big deal. No, it's real love when I'm stupid and flawed and inconvenient and get in your way and don't do what you want and you don't feel disappointed or irritated at me. Well, that really changes your perspective on love, doesn't it? Those two words separate real love from everything else, disappointment and irritation. Imagine at work that you've made a mistake. You probably wouldn't, but let's say you did. <laughs> 
And I come to you and I say, you know, you've made a mistake. Um, it'll cost us a couple hundred bucks to fix it. And she'll have to work overtime to help us. For, but we can fix it. Don't worry about it. But let me show you. If you'd be willing to do it this way instead of the way you did it, you're going to love this. It'll be faster, easier. You'll enjoy it more. It'll be more productive for the company, less likely to make mistakes. Would you be willing to do that? Yeah. Duh. Sure you would. <laughs> But most important, you can hear that even though I'm describing to you a mistake you made, my concern is for you. Can you hear that? But the instant that I say, God, you, how, do you recognize that tone of voice at all? Um, no, not at all. No. Huh? The instant I become irritated, my primary concern is for whom? For me. Do you see how important this is? That's true every single time. The instant I'm irritated, I'm saying, do you know that you have inconvenience, which you may not have realized is the true center of the universe? Me. <laughs> right. That's how arrogant anger is. How dare you have inconvenienced me? That's what we're saying every time we're irritated. And in that moment, there's no way in the world that you can feel my unconditional concern for you, is there? Uh-uh. Because when I'm irritated, what am I saying? Look what you did to me. Look what you should have done for me. In fact, in place of the word anger, you could put me, me, me. And while I'm standing above you screaming, me, 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 can you feel my unconditional concern for you? Uh, no, not ever. And yet look how often we as parents, for example, say to our children, I'm just so mad at you, but I still love you. Do you know that there's not a child on the planet stupid enough to believe that? We think we fool them, but we don't. Real love is unconditional. There is no disappointment or anger in real love, ever. Real love is much more than a principle. It's a power that must be felt. So in order to give you a more meaningful understanding of real love, I'd like to ask you to do an experiment with me. We're going to experience a few moments of real love right now. I'll help you do that as I take you on a brief guided meditation. First, eliminate any distractions around you. Close the door, turn off the music, mute the phone, whatever it takes. Then find a comfortable position and close your eyes. Now reach out in your mind and eliminate all the connections to the things that could be distracting. Your job, the kids, bills that need to be paid, computers fixed, cars repaired. Let it all go so that now you're completely free. We're getting in the back of a chauffeur-driven limousine and beginning a trip to a place known to very few people, a place to which you have been especially invited today. We're going to a valley far from here, a valley surrounded by mountains capped with snow and covered with trees, a valley filled with life, birds, other animals large and small, plants rich and green at every turn. Although the beauty of this place is unmatched, we're going there not because of what we'll see, but because of the people who live in the village there. You see, every one of these people feels completely, unconditionally loved. Because they have the most priceless treasure in all the world, because they feel loved, they are always genuinely, profoundly happy. In this place, there is no fear, no anger, no contention. And they've invited you so they can share with you what they have. After hours of driving, we turn off the main road onto a dirt path that weaves its way among the tall trees. Finally, we break free of the forest and see the village in the distance. As we stop in front of one of the homes, the doors of the house fly open and people pour out the doors, come down the steps and open the door of the limousine. Taking you by the hand, they guide you up the steps and through the front doors where you're greeted by warm light from every window, warm smiles from every face. With absolute certainty, you sense that the primary concern of everyone in that village is your happiness. You know that there is nothing you need do to get them to like you, 
nothing you could do that would embarrass you or shame you because they simply love you as you are. Feeling safe and peaceful, you begin to tell them the story of your life. You tell them about your mistakes, your fears, your flaws, your foolishness, and your successes. You share the whole thing, and they understand it all, love it all. They love you. In all your life, you have never felt this loved or this happy. Now, feel it. Allow the power of this love to seep into your skin, muscles, bones, and fill your soul. This is our entire reason to be alive, to feel this way, to feel this loved. You could stay in this place forever. Finally, the day comes to a close and we must go. Reluctantly, you get back in the car and travel back to the place where you're sitting now. Now, open your eyes. Think about the experience you just had. How did you feel while you were with the people in the village? Did you have any inclination at all to be angry at them? Ridiculous. Wouldn't even make sense to be angry at people who loved you like that. In fact, although you may not have thought about it at the time, when you were with the people in the village, did you feel any anger toward anybody else, even people not in the village? Of course not. When you were surrounded by that kind of love, your anger was just gone, wasn't it? As well as your fear. Love does that to anger. Now, what did we see from the time we were mm, this high? When we were quiet and clean and obedient and thrifty, brave, clean and reverent, when we did all the right things, what did people say? Oh, yeah, they spoke gently to us, didn't they? They, they smiled at us. Sometimes they even touched us. And they said, you're such a good girl or boy. Oh, do we love that or what? Ah, oh, I mean, when people talk to us like that, we wriggle like scratched puppies. It's like, oh, more. <laughs> but we also saw what happened the instant that we made too much noise in the car, fought with our sister, or dragged dog poop across the living room carpet. Then what happened? What happened to the smiles then? Gone in an instant. What happened to the gentle tones of voice? Poof all replaced with what I call the worst sound in the world for a child, which goes like this. You ever heard that sound? I know you've never made that sound, right? <laughs> Without meaning to, because our behavior changes so dramatically when we're disappointed or irritated at our children and because it happened to us as children, Here's the lesson that we learned as children ourselves and the lesson we teach our children. When you're good, I love you. When you're not, I don't. That's the lesson. Nobody meant to teach that lesson. It's not intentional. Nobody meant to hurt anybody. But the lesson is nonetheless received with absolute clarity. Everybody got it. In order to be happy, it's real love we need more than anything else. And most of us received very little of that as children. Haven't seen much of it as adults either. Now let's talk about the enormous effect the lack of real love has had on our lives. Now the problem is we cannot live without enough unconditional love. Do you get that? Real love is as important to our happiness as air and water are to our physical health. It's that indispensable. And so without it, the emptiness is Grand Canyon big. We can't tolerate it. We reach out for whatever will make us feel good in the moment. I learned to do that in the first grade, real early. I can still remember my first grade teacher. Remember what she looked like. I remember her name, Mrs. Woods. She was an old lady, probably 30. <laughs> and she held a piece of paper out in front of the class and she said, this is the only kid in the class that got all these questions right. Brilliant. I wish the rest of you were this smart. Well, that was fine with me because I was the brilliant kid. But do you know that for the rest of my life, I was hooked. If I couldn't get loved unconditionally, 
I learned that at least I could do all the right things, live up to a certain standard, so that people would say, you're so what? Wonderful, smart, intelligent, clever, responsible, handsome, never got that. <laughs> Beautiful, whatever it is. And we'll virtually trade our lives away to hear those words, won't we? You look at two people in conversation, and it's predictable. Do it sometime, now that you're aware that this happens. You look at two people in conversation. Can you tell when somebody disapproves of you? Oh, from across the street, you can tell. <laughs> and so we are very sensitive to other people's disapproval. When two people are talking, they're looking for those signs of disapproval. And if we see a little scrunching of the eyes, a little lifting of the brow, a little turning down of the mouth, a little tapping of the feet, shrugging of the shoulders, change in the tone of voice, any one of hundreds of signs of disapproval, what do we do? We change what we're saying to get rid of those signs of disapproval. It's more than just changing what we're saying. We change who we are to gain the approval of other people. Now, what's the problem with that? What if I say to you, give me $50 and I'll tell you I love you. I'd be happy to do that all day, by the way. <laughs> but at the end of the day, would you feel loved? No. no, because you'd know that you had to pay me to love you. You can't ever feel loved when you have to pay somebody to do that. And surely we're all thinking, well, nobody would be that silly. Nobody would be that stupid to pay somebody to love them. Well, actually, almost all of us are that stupid. Anytime we do anything to get somebody else to like us, with what we say, with what we do, with how we look, we're paying for their love. Do you see that? Do you recognize that pattern in your own life? Most of us give our whole lives away to together get other people to like us, and that's why we don't feel unconditionally loved, because we're paying for it. No amount of praise or other attention can ever feel truly satisfying if we have to pay for it with our behavior. You can't earn love. We can only feel loved when it's given to us unconditionally. If we don't have enough unconditional love in our lives, however, enough real love, we will pay for whatever we can get. We will. The pain's too big to go without it. If we don't have enough real love, we reach out for whatever will make us feel better. And any of the things that we use to feel better, that we use as substitutes for real love, I call imitation love. And imitation love comes in four forms. Praise, power, pleasure, and safety. Let's talk about each of them. Let's talk about praise. If we can't get enough real love, we will virtually kill to hear somebody say, you're so whatever. Wonderful, clever, witty, intelligent, beautiful, whatever it is. We love to hear that. But then what's the effect? For example, the boss at work says, nice job. Ooh, we love that. How long does that last? I hope I get a raise a long time. <laughs> <laughs> the raise lasts a long time. The compliment doesn't last very long, does it? It lasts, oh, maybe five minutes till he comes in and says, are you the one that screwed up this order? And then the pray, <laughs> he's already lying. <laughs> And then that feeling of nice job is pretty much gone, isn't it? That's the problem with praise, is that in the first place, you have to buy it. If you notice that when you do things for other people, um, you have to do the things they like in order for them to praise you. You noticed? You have to purchase their praise. Second, it's very temporary. It doesn't last. And then you have to work to earn it again and again. Do you get the picture of a hamster on a wheel, never quite getting anywhere? Third, you have to work harder and harder to get it. And you have to have more and more of it to get the same feeling. Do you remember what it was like when you were four years old and you tied your shoes right for the first time? And people said, oh, you're so clever. Does anybody praise you for that now? <laughs> no, you have to work a lot harder than tying your shoes to get praise now, don't you? Remember what it was like to get your first dollar. All the effects of every form of imitation love wear off. Then we have to work to get them, but you have to work harder. 
I have a friend who interviews celebrities for a living. And she was talking to a stand-up comedian who does you know, stand-up comedy and movies, and he's a really famous guy. And she said, what's it like being up there and getting all this you know, adoration and applause? And, and he said, well, I love it. He said, but you know, when I get in the limousine, even before I get to the hotel, I have to have more. Do you get the point? It doesn't last. And this guy's getting more praise than most of us will see in a lifetime in a single weekend. It counts for nothing eventually. And eventually, no matter how much you get, you never get an effect. It acts just like an addictive drug. Do you recognize that pattern? Anybody here other than me ever been addicted to alcohol or drugs? Ooh, two, that's unusual. In a lot of places I get no hands, which means of course that 10 to 20% of the population is addicted to alcohol or drugs except for where I am. <laughs> Gutless. And then at the break, people come up and say, you know, I've been in recovery for three years. Well, where were you? <laughs> if I injected 10 milligrams of my favorite drug, I would get a rush. If I injected it day after day, what happens? I don't get a rush anymore, do I? Now I've got to have 15 and 20 and 40, 100 milligrams. I was up to doses that if I were to shoot you with that amount, you would just fall over dead on the spot. You'd get used to it. And the same is true with every form of imitation love. All of them. Praise, power, pleasure, and safety. They feel great for a minute. And then you've got to have more the next time. And more and more, and it wears off, and eventually you're left with no effect at all. And with praise especially, you realize that as people praise you, they're not really saying anything to you about you. That what they're really saying is they like how you make them feel, right? When the boss comes up to you, for example, and says, nice job. Is there anybody here who suffers under the delusion that the boss means, I'm really glad you got a sense of satisfaction from that? No. <laughs> He's saying, I'm glad you made my life easier, right? Or, for example, when a woman uh, hears, oh, you're so beautiful. Women will kill to hear that, yeah? I mean, look at the size of the, what I call the looking good industry. The hair, the clothes, the cosmetics, the plastic surgery, it's bigger than General Motors. Women go to all of that trouble so that when they go out in public, at least for a moment, they either hear with words or behavior, looking fine. I like you. Yeah, see, she's already in love with me. It's pretty predictable. The problem is we need to look at when a guy says to a woman, you are so beautiful. What does he mean? He's, what he's saying is, I get the, the physical pleasure of looking at you. When I'm seen with a beautiful woman, people praise me more. I'm seen as a more worthwhile person, right? I mean, I must be more worthwhile if I can attract a beautiful woman, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, I get the physical pleasure of fantasizing about you. In case you women didn't know, I hate to let you in on this, but there's a lot of that going on. And if I tell you that you're beautiful enough times, the odds go up that I might be able to move to a higher level of pleasure with you. Just a fact. So it turns out that you're so beautiful is really all about me, not you. <laughs> so here are all these women going to these enormous lengths just so that a guy will essentially say, I'm looking forward to using you. That's an awful lot of trouble to go to, don't you think? <laughs> Most praise is about the person who's praising. I like how you make me feel. And yet, because it feels really pretty darn good, we do it from the time we're little kids. In fact, we're taught to do it. In the absence of real love, praise feels so darn good that most of us become praise junkies. We're addicted to it. How many of you have heard the expression, put your best foot forward? Who hasn't? Who hasn't taught that to their kids? Create a good first impression, blah, blah, blah. Then look what happens on a first date. It's a best foot festival, isn't it? <laughs> it's a lying fest. You could take these two people on a first date and take their best feet and they could have the date together, couldn't they?
So here are these two people sitting across from each other at the dinner table, just lying through their teeth. You wouldn't recognize them in real life. <laughs> and you know what the worst possible result is of me trying to create a good first impression with you? The worst result is not that I'll fail. The worst result is that I'll succeed. So here we are, and I've created a great first impression by putting my best foot forward, and so have you. And then we fall in love <laughs> and get married. And then about, oh, six months from now, one or both of us rolls over in bed one morning and goes, who are you? <laughs> because no matter how good you are at putting your best foot forward, eventually the other person discovers you have another foot. <laughs> and it stinks. And there's lots more to you than just your best foot and your other stinky foot. We have, there's lots to us. And then the, per, but see the problem is we started the relationship based on a deception, didn't we? Because when we put our best foot forward, what am I telling you essentially? This is who I really am. No, it's not. Then when you discover who I really am, what are you going to feel? Disappointed, irritated, and you're going to feel like I lied to you. You know what? You're right, but so did you. Really? <laughs> we, and we don't lie intentionally, do we? It isn't intentional. We just want people to like us, that's all. The problem is, the instant I do anything to get you to like me, how can it feel unconditional now, see? I'm buying it from you but we're willing to keep buying love from people because for a moment it does feel good. There was a study done of incoming freshman women at a major university. So this was several thousand women. And they found that 65% of these women had a significant eating disorder. Bulimia, anorexia, two thirds. You believe that number? Now why would two thirds of these young women be willing to injure themselves? Because everybody on the planet knows that if you're considered physically beautiful, you'll be treated quite different from women who are not considered physically beautiful, right? And as though we didn't know that already, they did a study to prove it. So they took a room full of people, and on one end of the room they put a model, gorgeous woman. And on the other end of the room they put a woman, and you have to be really careful when you say this not to look at a woman. <laughs> <laughs> who was considered less attractive. In fact, she looked a lot like you. <laughs> you make a lousy looking woman. And, and all they did was they counted the number of times that people walked up to these two women and said anything. Pretty easy study, huh? Anybody have any doubt how that went? The woman who was considered less attractive was treated like she had a disease. No kidding. She was avoided completely. Not just by the men, but equally by the women. Isn't that embarrassing that we're that shallow? That being praised for our physical beauty is that central to the way we organize ourselves socially? It's embarrassing. But it's really important to us. And we're willing to do virtually anything to be praised for being physically beautiful. In fact, we even perpetuate the importance of this with our children in the fairy tales we tell them, the bedtime stories we tell them when we put them to bed. When was the last time you heard the fairy tale of the princess who was kind of average looking? <laughs> no. No, no, it's the beautiful princess, isn't it? Like it was one word? <laughs> the beautiful princess, and then along comes the handsome prince, one word. They don't ever say the kind of homely, ugly looking princess. No. And then the prince that makes everybody throw up? Nah. -uh. Without meaning to, what are we teaching our children? that if you're not beautiful or handsome, you're not worthy of being praised, and by implication, you're not worthy of being loved. Yikes! Do you see the, the horror of that message? We get praised in other ways. We get praised by the gratitude that we earn from people. Do you know what the primary reason is that we give people gifts? To earn their gratitude. And I've said that to thousands of people now, and 90 plus percent of them say, not me. And I say, really? So let's do this. Picture yourself going out and you shop for weeks to find the perfect gift. It was expensive, it took you a lot of time, you wrap it with a bow, you take it to your whoever, husband, wife, child, and they look at it and go, oh, 
throw it on the floor and stomp on it and kick it out the door. Are you annoyed? <laughs> if we're annoyed, then it wasn't really a gift, was it? We give people things so they'll be grateful to us. Because when people are grateful to us, wow, we feel generous and magnanimous. We feel good, don't we? We love that. I used to do this in public. I don't do it anymore. But I, with a stopwatch, I'd go to McDonald's and just watch mothers and fathers hand their children an ice cream cone. The child has 2.3 seconds in which to respond. If they don't respond in 2.3 seconds, what do the parents say? Now, what do you say? <laughs> now, some parents claim, oh, well, I'm just trying to teach my child gratitude. Really? Then when the child doesn't say thank you, what does the parent do? Gets irritated. If we were genuinely trying to teach gratitude, there wouldn't be any irritation. The biggest reason we like our children to be grateful, we like our children to be grateful to us to make us happy, to make us feel praised, rather than teaching them to be grateful for what they have. And there's quite a difference. We get a sense of praise from lots of things, a sense of acceptance, the gifts that we give, what we call respect. I want to be respected is really ju just a need for praise, a form of imitation love. There in the United States Air Force Academy, in uh, just last year, there was a sex scandal that broke out. Uh, one of the female cadets claimed, and it was proven actually, that she was sexually abused by one or more of her superiors there. And when that came to light, 150 other female cadets, or some who had already been graduated, came forward, and they had similarly been abused in the previous 10 years. Why had they not come forward? Because they were terrified of being rejected of not being accepted. We will do almost anything to avoid people not liking us. It's that big a thing. Next, power. Power is the feeling that we get when we can control another person. Why would we do that? Why would we control another person? It sounds like an ugly thing, doesn't it? When we don't have enough unconditional love in our lives, we feel empty and alone. We feel helpless and afraid. Anybody here like feeling helpless? It's an awful feeling. When I am able to control you in any way, when I can reach out and control what you do, look what happens. I feel a little stronger, see? Mm -hmm. Less helpless, <laughs> quit it. <laughs> Don't resist me here. I feel a little less helpless, and look what else I get. There's a connection from me to you. Now it's sick. But when we don't have enough love, we feel alone, and any connection feels better than none. If I can control what you do, I actually get the illusion that you agree with me in some way. Isn't that weird? Do you know that slave owners in the South used to write about how their slaves loved them? Oh, wake up. They were just afraid of being sold or beaten. But if you can control somebody enough, you get the feeling like they agree with you, like your buddies. Uh -uh. You just control them. But controlling other people feels better than nothing at all. Now, when we talk about controlling people, when we talk about abuse of power, we tend to picture, what, politicians, uh, prison guards, uh, slave owners. But do you know who the worst abusers of power are on the planet? Do you recognize the tone in my voice, young man? He's going, Dad. <laughs> Parents are the worst abusers of power. Why would a parent do that to a child? Because as adults, on the whole, we feel helpless and out of control most of the time. We can't control the traffic, the weather, our jobs, the government. We lost control of our spouses after about three months. We feel helpless. <laughs> but you know, when we come home from work and that little child isn't moving fast enough, and we say, now what did I tell you? And that child moves faster. Now again, we don't do this intentionally. But when that child moves faster, we get a feeling of power. We don't do it to be ugly, but it does make us feel less helpless. And we will repeat anything that makes us feel better for a moment. Do you see that? All the forms of imitation love just temporarily fill up our emptiness. Pleasure. It hurts to not feel loved. 
it's, it, it's as painful as having a truck run over your foot. Anything that will distract us from the pain of not feeling loved or that will temporarily alleviate the pain, we'll do it. So what are some forms of pleasure that we use? Drugs, alcohol, sex, food, shopping, gambling, um, driving fast, uh, lots of things that we do. Anything that gives us an emotional or physical rush. That's all, any of those, and there's, uh, the list goes on and on. And I'm not implying that all pleasure is bad. Oh no, not at all. Pleasure is bad only when it's used as a substitute for real love. And since 99% of us don't have an adequate supply of real love, that would mean that pleasure is abused 99% of the time. No kidding. How do you tell? Look at the maniacal, obsessive, addictive way that we pursue pleasure. That's how you tell. Can you give it up? Look at, what's the number one product sold on the internet? Pornography. Number one. That's not just a pleasure that adds to somebody's already full and unconditionally loved life. No, it's used as a substitute for the real love that isn't there. And that's true with most gambling, all the other things. They're used to substitute for the real thing. Safety. If I'm smacking you in the head with a board, what would you like most? For me to quit, wouldn't yeah. you? <laughs> Men usually say to hit you back. <laughs> when, when we're in pain, not being in pain is very attractive, isn't it? And that's what safety is, is the alleviation of pain or the elimination of it. And we'll do vir virtually anything to get it. Um, and we tend to, when we, get, when we achieve safety, to confuse that with love. I've talked to many couples who've been married for 20, 30, 40 years, and I say, so how's your relationship? Well, you know what well means? It stinks. <laughs> if you're in a richly rewarding, loving, mutually enriching relationship, and somebody says to you, how's your relationship? You don't say, well... No, well means my partner and I have learned to avoid the behaviors that are most hurtful and irritating. We've achieved, instead of love, kind of a measure of safety, a negotiated truce. And you know that most marriages are based on safety, an exchange of imitation love, not on real love. It's very attractive. So you can see, I think, how common the use of imitation love is, can't you? It's everywhere, and it would have to be everywhere. Because real love is relatively rare, of course we're gonna use imitation love. Every chance that we get. Pick up a newspaper, and it's a catalog of the uses of imitation love. See that? Every crime that you read about, they're all the pursuit of imitation love. Now, this could look, I suppose, a little discouraging, the fact that we use these all the time, but it's not. It's the beginning of hope. You see, when we don't realize that we're doing a thing, we can only repeat it over and over again and never be happy. We will spend the rest of our lives trying to create happiness with something that can never create it. Once we see what we're doing, we can change our behavior. Imagine that you're starving to death in the middle of the desert not just missed a snack, but starving, and you come across a truck full of chocolate. Ooh, yippee. What would you do? <laughs> you would eat the chocolate, wouldn't you? Not might, it'd be how much, not might. So you'd fill your belly with cho chocolate, and for a moment, you'd feel great. Your belly would be full, you'd have more energy, it would taste great, uh, wonderful. But if you stay there by the truck of chocolate in the desert for long enough, you will die because there aren't enough nutrients in the chocolate alone to sustain life. In fact, the truck, the, well, not the truck, but the chocolate in the truck would actually kill you because it will distract you by giving the, you the illusion that you're doing better. Do you see that? And that's the problem with imitation love. It feels so good in the short term that we're fooled by it, we're seduced by it, tricked, so that we keep using it instead of doing what it takes to get the real thing. And in the end, it will therefore kill us.
But without real love, we will use imitation love. And we don't just casually pursue it. We pursue it desperately. Everywhere we go, in fact, we don't do it intentionally, but we do it nonetheless. You walk into a room full of people, and we do little imitation love assessments. No. No. Maybe. <laughs> we do that. You think about, think about how many times in your life you have met, you, you've got walked into a room full of strangers, and just immediately clicked with somebody and thought, you know, I just, I think I'm going to like that person more. Based on what? Based on what they will give you in the form of imitation love. When a guy looks at a girl across a crowded room and he turns to his buddies and he says, I think I'm in love. Is there anybody here who believes that what he means is, I think I've fallen into a sudden, unconditional concern for her happiness? <laughs> no. 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 What he's saying is, I see in that woman the greatest possible return to me of imitation love. And it's not just about sex. He's saying, you can tell after 30 seconds with somebody whether they're more likely to accept you or not, can't you? So, praise whether they're more likely to do what you ask them to do or not, power, whether they're, and it, when it comes to couples, whether they're more likely to have sex with you, pleasure, whether they're more likely to attack you or not, safety. Within 30 seconds, you can do an assessment of how much imitation love you'll get from somebody, and that's how we determine whether we'll like them, right in the beginning. Yikes! But when that's all we've got, that's what we do, and that's how we start our relationships. In fact, you can quantify it. Let's do that. We want to not just wait for how much imitation love rolls downhill to us. We want to go out there and maximize our return, right? So what we do is we go out and we kind of, it's like going, it's like chummy for fish. You throw it out and go, no, nothing there. Nothing there. So let's, let's, let's put numbers to it. Let's say that I throw a dollar's worth of imitation love out to you. Praise, power, whatever it is. And you give me 10 cents in return which is a very common rate of exchange. Have you noticed you rarely get back as much as you give other people? It's just a fact. You cook dinner for somebody for four hours and they sit down and, go <laughs> and walk out. It's not a one for one thing. <laughs> <clears throat> so I give you a dollar and you give me 10 cents. Well, I'm not gonna like you, am I? No. So then I give you a dollar and you give me 20 cents. I'll hate you less, but that's not enough. So I give you a dollar and you give me 50 cents. Better? In fact, that's a lot better than most people give me. You and I could be buddies. That's not bad. But then one day, <laughs> I give you a dollar and you give me a dollar back. Ah, Eureka! What do you think I'm gonna do now? I'm gonna give you another dollar to see if it happens again, right? And if you give me another dollar back, oh, sweetie, I'm going to hook up to the fire hose. I'm going to give you everything I've got. And if you return to me, dollar for dollar, everything I give you, I'm in love. Yeah. Do you know, there are countless books and magazine articles and movies that are dedicated to the subject of falling in love, right? And do you know what they're... Cent their overall conclusion is, we don't know why it happens. It's like a mystery. We treat falling in love like being hit with a rock falling out of the sky. We don't know why it happens. It's no mystery. Falling in love is the relatively equal and abundant exchange of imitation love. Isn't that romantic? <laughs> now, how do I know that that's true? Because what follows falling in love almost like night follows day? Falling out of love, doesn't it? Almost every time. And this isn't just in intimate relationships. It happens at work and other places. The new boss comes in. And, oh, oh we like him much better. Oh, yeah. Mm. And then after, you know, a couple of months, oh, I knew he was a loser all along. <laughs> because the new source of imitation love wore off. Do you see? So here you and I are madly in love. And, of course, we really believe we are that it's real love because, gosh, it feels so good. 
And in fact, it feels so good, then we get married. Do you know why people get married? To lock in the exchange rate. <laughs> no joke. I mean, if you're going to give me dollar for dollar, do you think I'm going to let you go? <laughs> no. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to drag you up in front of the minister and the congregation and everybody else and our families and everybody else I can think of, and I'm going to grab you by the back of your hair, and I'm going to essentially say to you now, you turned, now, of course, what I say out loud is, I love you very much. But what I really mean is, I need you. That's what I love you means 95% of the time. Now, I want you to turn to all these nice people here, and I want you to promise them that you're going to keep giving me dollar for dollar for the rest of my life and make me happy. And because you're very naive and a little dense, you turn to them and you say, I do. <laughs> Not realizing that you are doomed. Because now what's going to happen? You and I are going to keep doing this dollar for dollar thing, but about six months from now, after the time we get married, one day I'm going to give you a dollar's worth of imitation love, praise, power, pleasure, whatever. And you're going to give me a dollar back like you've always done. But do you remember what always happens with the effect of imitation love? It wears off, doesn't it? So even though you give me a dollar today, it's going to feel like 50 cents. Do you see the problem? I'm not going to like that. Do you think I'm stupid? I'm not going to keep giving you a dollar for 50 cents, so I'm going to get you back and give you 50 cents. You're not going to like that. So you're going to either give me a quarter to show me, or you might even try to overcompensate by giving me two dollars. Either way, the effect is going to wear off. And in the distance, you can already hear the RT, the relationship toilet, flushing, <laughs> can't you? This relationship is already over. You see that? And this, this just drives people crazy, doesn't it? When relationships end, I've canceled now thousands of couples. Every one of them started off in love, yeah? And then when it falls apart, they are just baffled. What happened? We were so in love once, why are we miserable now? Well, the answer is very easy. We make it very complicated. Because, see, if you made me really happy in the beginning, and now I'm not, I, don't, I can only see two ways to go. It could be my fault. No. Or it could be, oh, it's your fault, and I'll blame you. And that's what we do, isn't it? When I see couples for counseling, it's this. It's him, no, it's her. You know, they blame each other. What a relief to learn that it's not either of their faults. Relationships fail. Not because of what one person does or does not do, but because both partners come to the relationship without enough of the one thing, the one element, real love, that is most essential to happiness individually and success in a relationship. Make sense? Most relationships are doomed from the word hello because there wasn't enough real love to start with. We thought it was great in the beginning, but we were just kidding ourselves. When the imitation love wore off, we realized what we really had, which was really nothing from the beginning. Yikes. But actually, it's not horrifying. W once we realize what the problem is, we can now solve it by getting enough real love, and we're going to get to that. Understanding real love also explains why we keep attracting the same lousy partners. Have you noticed? You leave a guy and three months later you're with the same guy with a different face? <laughs> Happens all the time. I talked to a lady recently who said, I've been married and divorced five times. Every guy turned out to be a rat. I said, well, have you ever thought that you might be rat bait? <laughs> I mean, if everywhere you go there's a little trail of rats, there like, might be a lesson there. What do you think? And the reason that that happens is this. We all go out trying to attract a partner with the same combination of imitation love that we've been using from the beginning. We are desperate to get it. We go out with essentially a billboard on our forehead that says, looking to trade. And we go out with a certain combination to trade with. You've noticed that certain people tend to offer more praise and certain people more pleasure, haven't you? People, you've all heard the, the phrase, for example, people pleasers. People pleasers are willing to do whatever you want, give you a sense of power, but what do they want in return? Your acceptance. 
So they are power for praise traders. Make sense? Let's say that the combination of imitation love that you offer is five parts praise, four parts power, two parts pleasure, and three parts safety. You are a five, four, two, three seller. So your billboard says, looking to trade, and underneath it says five, four, two, three. And if there's somebody who likes a five, four, two, three, oh, whoa, they'll be in love with you. If there isn't, you won't find somebody who will fall in love with you. But five miles from here, there will be somebody who will be going, Herb, you smell that five, four, two, three? <laughs> and they will find you from across the street, from across the continent, because you advertise it. And that's how we keep getting the same lousy partners over and over again. Imitation love also explains the phenomenon of midlife crisis. A midlife crisis is just the point where we realize that all the imitation love we've worked so hard for up to that point in our lives will never make us happy. And that is one terrible, frightening moment. Then we go kind of crazy in a way, looking for other forms of imitation love. That's why a man, for example, who has been addicted to praise and power will suddenly leave his wife and hope that imitation love in the form of sex and pleasure just might make him happy. But of course, it never does. Before we leave the basic subjects of real love and imitation love, let me go over some, just a few definitions and concepts. I said that real love is caring about the happiness of somebody else without wanting something in return. But, but let me be clear about what happiness is. Happiness is not just excitement or titillation or getting what you want or succeeding in controlling other people. It's not just an absence of crisis. It's not just getting all the sex, money, power, and imitation love you want. You have to be real careful about the definition of happiness. Because when people have enough imitation love in the short term, they think they have it. Real happiness is a long-lasting, deep-seated peace that doesn't come or go or doesn't leave you with changing circumstances and in fact can actually grow during difficult circumstances. And in fact, genuine happiness can only be had when we feel unconditionally loved, when we are unconditionally loving other people, and when we're living according to certain laws that govern being happy. Being happy. And we're going to talk about more of those in subsequent uh, modules. You can't just do what you want and count on being happy. With real love, nothing else matters. Without it, nothing else is enough. And I'll use that statement several times and I want to clarify it. I'm not saying that there's nothing else in life except for real love that contributes to happiness. There are other things. Genetic factors, uh, our health, uh, having enough to live on, and so on. But none of those things, individually or all together, can ever make us happy in the absence of real love. And because it's the understanding and the acquisition of real love that we have the greatest trouble with, that's the thing I'm going to be emphasizing the most, and that's why I emphasize that phrase, with real love nothing else matters, and without it nothing else is enough. So let me summarize this module. In order to be happy, what we need more than anything else is real love. Second, the vast majority of us have not received enough unconditional real love. We've been loved conditionally from the time we were little children through no fault or blaming of anybody. It's just been the way it's been. You can't give what you ain't got. And if our parents and others failed to love us unconditionally, it's only because they weren't loved unconditionally either. There's no blaming to go around. Without sufficient real love, we naturally reach out to fill our intolerably painful emptiness with imitation love, with praise, power, pleasure, and safety. We just will. If somebody steps on your foot, you will move it. We respond to pain. There was a French philosopher that says, to goodness we make only promises, but pain we obey. When we're hurting, we move. When we feel empty and afraid, we will reach out to use imitation love. We establish relationships with people based on how much imitation love we can get from them. And in the beginning, that feels pretty darn good. 
But because the effects of imitation love are always purchased, because they're superficial and temporary, those relationships are virtually guaranteed to fail from the beginning. And last, fifth, relationships fail not because of what one partner did or did not do. Boy, does that take the guilt and the accusations out of failed relationships. But because both partners tried to build a relationship with a currency, imitation love, that can never buy happiness. I have shared the principles of real love with people all over the world, and I'm impressed with the absolutely consistent positive results experienced by those who diligently apply these principles. People are simply amazed at the genuine, lasting differences they're seeing in their lives, often quite noticeable in a matter of days or weeks. Singles are completely changing the way they see love, falling in love, and dating. Finally, they're finding the kind of partners they've always wanted, and they're learning what it takes to build those relationships in a healthy and lasting way. Married couples are learning how to overcome the wounds and obstacles that have been bleeding the joy out of their relationships. They're learning how to really love one another, and in the process, they're creating a level of happiness they'd never imagined possible. Parents are discovering that raising children who feel loved and who are loving and responsible is so much easier and fruitful than everything else they've tried. Parenting doesn't have to be the stressful and confusing experience that it is for so many of us. We've all experienced so much frustration, irritation, and pain in our lives that we've come to accept it as normal. It does not have to be that way. The bottom line is this. People are eliminating the fear, frustration, and anger from their lives, and instead they're finding peace and real power as they feel unconditionally loved and as they share that real love with others. These people are not unique. You too can learn to find the genuine happiness they have found, and we at the Real Love Institute will help you every step of the way. We have learned from a great deal of experience the tools required to make the search for real love and genuine happiness as enjoyable and effective as possible, and we want to share them with you. Dear Greg, it seems like I walk around irritated at somebody almost all the time, and it's not getting better. What can I do? As I described in the second module of the Essentials of Real Love seminar online, imagine that I'm about to take $2 off your kitchen table and run off with it. If that's your last $2, you'd be much more likely to get angry and stop me than you would if you had $20 million. Your reaction to me would be determined much more by your personal financial situation than it would be by my behavior. Similarly, the reason we get angry at people is much more related to how empty we are at the time than it is to what they've done or not done in that moment. When you understand the selfishness of anger, that you're using it to protect yourself and to get what you want, and that other people don't make you angry, you'll find it much more difficult to justify your anger. And without that justification, your anger will just naturally diminish. True understanding about where our anger comes from is much more effective in eliminating it than sheer willpower, a New Year's resolution, for example, or anger management. Anger management tends to work about as well as sticking a cork in a volcano. Dear Greg, everywhere we go, my husband looks at other women. I don't think he's having an affair or anything, but I still feel like he's cheating on me. You're quite right. Your husband is cheating on you. When we get married, we promise to be completely faithful to our wives sexually. Completely. Not 50% or 90% or even 99%. 
When we go out in public and look at other women or touch them or flirt with them, we're telling our partners that our sexual attention is wandering. Same when we gawk at other women's bodies on television, on the internet or wherever. There's no other way to interpret that. We're violating our promise. But let's not get distracted here with blaming and attacking him. We're just correctly identifying what he's doing. You've already proven that blaming your husband and trying to control him are a complete waste of time and energy. It will be much more helpful for you to understand why he's behaving as he does. So let's imagine that your husband is out in the middle of the desert and he's starving to death. He comes across a truck filled with cotton candy. What does he do? He eats it, of course. It tastes good. It gives him energy. It fills his belly. Now, it's not genuinely nourishing. In fact, on a diet of cotton candy alone, he'll die. But he eats it because temporarily it tastes and feels a lot better than nothing. Emotionally speaking, your husband is starving. Not for food, but for real love, unconditional love. From the time he was a small child, people loved him when he was good, but disapproved of him when he made mistakes and got in their way. He was loved conditionally, and that left him feeling empty, alone, and afraid. He uses women to briefly help him feel less empty and alone in the absence of real love. Now that doesn't justify what he's doing, but it does explain it in a way that we can now approach in a much more meaningful way and find a solution. Understand that he is just empty and alone and he needs more real love in his life. Be understanding of your husband rather than critical or angry. Talk to him to explain how you feel and to commit to love him better rather than to make demands and control him. If you can talk to him without any irritation whatever, it's very likely that he'll hear you. As you learn to accept and love him, you will be rewarded beyond your ability to imagine. Dear Greg, my boyfriend and I first met six months ago, and in the beginning, we couldn't have had more fun. We did everything together. He was good looking, intelligent, had a good job and a great sense of humor. Sexually, we couldn't have been more compatible. But now things have changed, and I just don't understand it. You say he's good looking. In other words, he provides you with the physical pleasure of looking at an attractive man and of fantasizing about the pleasure you might have with him. In addition, when you're seen with a good looking man, other people think better of you. You say he's intelligent, which provides you, again, with stimulating conversation, as well as someone who can solve problems, for example, that might come up from time to time. He has a good job. That's a nice source of potential security, again, for you. You say he has a great sense of humor, which means that you enjoy how he entertains you. He pleases you sexually. Again, it's about how he pleases you. Notice the pattern here? All these characteristics have nothing to do with real love. You're describing how he provides imitation love for you and makes you feel better in the short term. You'd only have that interest if you hadn't received enough real love up to this point in your own life. But the effects of imitation love always wear off, as you've noticed in several relationships. What you don't realize is that the old magic was an illusion. It was a lie based on imitation love. From the beginning, your relationship was not based on real love. So pretty much it was doomed from the start. So what can you do now? It would be pretty difficult for you to learn about unconditional love while you stayed with your boyfriend because you'd be very distracted by the enormous expectations you have of him. You'd be constantly disappointed and irritated at him. On the whole, you'll find it much, much easier to leave this relationship right now. It doesn't get easier with time. And start over. Review the Essentials of Real Love video and read the book, Real Love, The Truth About Finding Unconditional Love and Fulfilling Relationships. As you feel enough real love, you won't be fooled by imitation love again. You won't start relationships based on that flawed foundation. Instead, you'll look for and you will find relationships based on the truth. Those are the ones that last. 
the kind you've been looking for all your life. As you learn the principles of real love, it's very likely that you'll have many questions. You'll wonder, exactly what does this principle mean? How would I apply that to my husband or my child or on a date? I have seen the results of real love in so many lives and with such consistency that I don't hesitate to make you a promise. If you will dedicate yourself to the pursuit and sharing of real love, you will be rewarded in ways you can scarcely imagine at this point. I know this sounds like a grand claim, but real love has a greater power to change our lives than anything else. By far, it simply works. What would you pay for a sense of absolute peace? For the power to feel happy and undisturbed in the face of any conflict or difficult situation? for the feeling that you are loved without condition and the ability to share that feeling with those around you. Frankly, we already pay with everything we have, with our very lives, for much less than the positive feelings and qualities I just described. We trade everything we have for conditional approval, for power, and for other things that are pale, shallow imitations of love. Essentially, we give up everything in return for nothing. The price for finding real love is much less than what we're paying now. We only have to learn a few real love principles, and then we will change the way we see and feel about everything. I have counseled with a great number of people from all over the world, and I've seen individuals, couples, and parents spend countless thousands of dollars on individual counseling, group therapy, marriage counseling, and professional help for their children. Singles spend vast sums on internet dating and on the dating process itself. And by way of contrast, I've received thousands of communications now from people who have said that exposure to real love has made all that counseling and professional help completely unnecessary for them. Real love has revolutionized their lives in dating, marriage, parenting, business, and every other aspect of life. I personally know of no more powerful way to begin the journey toward real love than to subscribe to the Real Love Institute, and it won't cost thousands of dollars. The monthly cost of subscription is less than the cost of a dinner for two, less than the cost of half an hour of therapy, less than a dollar a day. As a physician, I have stood at the bedsides of many people who are close to death, and I can tell you that at the end of our lives, we don't care how much money we have. We don't care how many people we control or how big our house is or how many people we've persuaded to praise us or respect us. What matters to us is how loved we feel and how well we have loved those around us. Don't wait till the end of your life to figure out these pivotal priorities. Decide now that you'll do whatever it takes to find and share real love. As you do that, you will find the happiness you've always wanted as an individual and you'll be able to participate with far more power and pleasure in all your relationships, dating, marriage, parenting, other family associations, friendships, and in the workplace. I'd say do it now. You just can't do this stuff soon enough. And the more you practice, there's sometimes a fear because it brings up all of these issues, but when you do it and you make a commitment and you take action, it will transform your life. Are you willing to be happy and are you willing to do the steps necessary to get you there? Sign up today. Do it. Stop everything you're doing right now and do it. Don't hesitate. Jump in. It, it's just remarkable and I think so many times we hear from people, you should try this, it'll change your life. And this is, you hear that and then you try something for a couple of weeks and you think, oh, forget about that and you move on. This is totally different. 
and this has been um, two years that I've been working on these principles with my marriage, with my kids, in my friendships and relationships, and it's amazing how it can change your life and how you can just become a whole lot more peaceful and happy walking through your days. Oh, I would encourage it, absolutely. Um, I, it, I'm very excited about it. In fact, I can't help but tell people about it. It has changed my life so much that I would encourage everybody to jump in head first and do as much of it as they can because the results are phenomenal. If someone were considering learning more about real love, I would think that it would be the greatest gift that they could give to themselves and to everyone that's in their life. Not only will they enrich their happiness, oh, their, the happiness of everyone else will increase tremendously. It's one of the best things that they could ever do. I'd recommend it for anybody, no matter what stage. I mean, whether you're a young person, a middle-aged, or an older person like I am, to, I mean, there's always ways that you can learn more and not shut yourself up, up and be open to new things. It's really great. Do it, hurry, uh, you know, go and, and, uh, and seek it out because I, I look at, at the age that I am and I, I certainly wish that I had learned, known of it sooner and, and could have practiced more of it. I think it would have saved me a lot of heartache and possibly saved my marriage. Drop everything you're doing and get involved. Talk to a friend, read the book, call someone that's read the book, get to a seminar and get involved. It's that important. Never be satisfied with just getting along in life. Don't just survive as most people do. Don't be satisfied with any more superficial or unproductive relationships. Instead, take this opportunity to subscribe to the Real Love Institute and find the unconditional love and fulfilling relationships you've always wanted. You'll be grateful for the rest of your life that you took this step. Remember, it's always about real love.